obviously we have a great turnout and it's because everybody's interested in economic development in our city we all realize uh, how important it is for us to get something done so my job today really is to uh, introduce our, our speaker um, John Butler uh, has been a friend of mine for a while as I was on the LSU Board of Supervisors. He is probably one of the biggest LSU fans uh, that I know. Uh, after a game, I heard him sitting there talking about economic development. And I always thought that John was just sort of a ex-band guy. He was the uh, first African-American uh, trumpet player in the band. And Charlie Roberts and him would go to town after every game and Lod Cook. And then one day I heard him talking about economic development. And it sounded like he had been taping my, my uh, uh, morning meditation sessions because everything he was saying was everything that I had been thinking over the years that we needed to do in Shreveport. Uh, so I grabbed him and I said, you know, John, you don't know me very well, but would you spend about 10 minutes with me in the, in the um, boardroom here? And so he did, and he downloaded to me everything that I had ever wished for, finding somebody that would know all the details about how to um, start and nourish an economic development program that catered to the entrepreneur. Um, you know, the, the, the city, every city, to have a good economic development needs, you know, three things. They need to recruit, and that's what we've been doing for the last, you know, 50 years, is recruiting big companies to come into town, and that's really what government has been focused on. And so that's the number, you know, I, I still think that that's the number one economic development, to recruit people into your community, big companies that already exist. The second one is sustaining the companies that you have. I went to uh, Disney World one time and took my company down there, and we had a, a you know dog and pony show by Walt Disney's management. And basically, they feel that you know to keep companies in your town, it, it it's it, it's a, a seven to one. You know you have to spend seven times as much money recruiting a company in as you do keeping one. And then the third leg is the entrepreneur, how to create companies. And we really haven't done that uh, much. Cohab's here, and Cohab is in that box. And we felt that, or I felt that we needed to do it in a, a, in a manner that had a little, um, you know, umph to it uh, to get people interested in supporting not only LSU Medical Center and research, okay, and that, that funnel but we have um, 110, 20,000 students between Mississippi and a little bit of Texas and Arkansas, 120,000 students. Now, if a fourth of those graduate every year, they need jobs. Now, I can tell you, our economy is not growing by 20,000 or so students every year, okay? We, we, it's just not happening. Uh, when I was born, uh, we were about 350,000 people with the uh, Metro Bossier and Shreveport. That's about what we are today. 1959, Baton Rouge was that size, and Austin, Texas was that size. Uh, I think we fell behind those other two guys. And we're here to, I brought, you know, John's the perfect person because he loves Baton Rouge. He grew up in that area, and he lives in Austin. So he's got three legs of this stool, that triangle, he, two of them. He's been there and knows how they work, and I'm hoping he can show us how to work. Um, John, I asked him what he wanted to say about him, about him yesterday. They, they gave me some writings to say about him. We've, you know, we're friends, and, and the first thing he said is, I, I, don't forget I'm a, a Vietnam veteran. And he said that before anything. And uh, I think that's kind of special from a guy who, and we appreciate that in this town because of Barksdale, and we, we appreciate the military. And so for him to say that kind of warmed my heart because he's also, he ran the Fulbright program, a presidential appointment under Bush. So for him to stick that in front of the other, 
and not to mention all his accolades, and I'm not going to tell them all here, but you know he is, was the director up until last year of IC Squared Institute in Texas. He was instrumental in getting Dell started, Whole Foods, which we all or you know, wanting to come to Shreveport. He knows these guys on first name basis. He calls them. Um, I forget the, uh, uh, he's the uh, chair uh, of the, uh, who, 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 what's his name? Herb Keller. Herb, Herb Keller, uh, of, um, <laughs> uh, chair. And, and so those are special things. And for him to say he's a vet, I think that's great. And John's here to tell y'all uh, what we've done, we've, we've, we've gotten money from the city and the parish, and I want to thank everybody here from the city and the parish to give us some money to go do this, to try this third leg of the stool economic development. Uh, we took a group down to Austin oh, over a year ago to look at this model. Um, Jay and the team and me have uh, researched multi-institutional programs we picked his because of our, our relationship with him. We've taken a few pieces from, from Ohio Tech Columbus. We've all flown up there and see how they do it up there. They're uh, more of our size cities that we can grasp. You know, we got Stanford and we got MIT and the Boston area. We got those two areas, and those are really the hubs of entrepreneurship. And so I'll quit talking bring John up here and let him tell you what's what's what we he imagines that maybe we can be uh, thank you very much John let me tell you it's, it's always good to be back in uh, <coughs> the great state of Louisiana I'm a southern Louisiana boy but I want to know that uh, my roots are Cane River and uh, Manny Louisiana my uh, I'm a Sibley uh, my mother was a Sibley and uh, she grew up in uh, and Cane River, and our father was from Coutreville. And so I do have some uh, roots from uh, northern Louisiana. Uh, when, when John approached me in, uh, in Baton Rouge, my, uh, my first uh, reaction was, it's about time. <laughs> I've been in, in Austin for one of my 40th year now. I left here and went to Northwestern University in Chicago and did my graduate work and came back as a professor at the University of Texas and uh, also helped out with my family business in southern Louisiana, my grandfather's, which was uh, all in gas on, on the Tuscaloosa train. The point is, you look around and what I want to do today is talk about the basic molding of lessons learned from Austin and maybe Silicon Valley and what's happening in America in terms of job creation and, as John said, uh, economic development. And the whole idea for us in Austin started as a new way of doing business. So yes, when I got to, uh, to UT Austin in 1974 from, from Northwestern, we had a big problem. We were losing all of our best and brightest. They were going to Silicon Valley, they were going to 128 in Boston. And basically Austin was a town that was very, very small. The only opportunities we had were state government and the University of Texas. State Farm had just put a, a plant there. So we had a dean by the name of George Kosmeski, who was the founder of Teledyne, and George said, look, we need to do something different. What we want to do is to create and get into this game of a new way of business. We get on the airplane, we go out to Silicon Valley, there was a holiday inn out there at Stanford, we were staying, we said, what the hell are these people doing out here? You got Hewlett Packard booming, you got Apple, you got Hotmail, you got eBay, and Lord, what else? And furthermore, they're taking everything that we had. So we sat down and said, we're going we're gonna to create this new way of, of doing enterprise, of doing business, and we're going to bring it to Austin. We're not Dallas, and we're not Houston. At that time, all in gas had moved from Shreveport, Louisiana, to Houston, Texas. And of course, Houston was in the oil boom, and of course, they had some problems in, in the 1980s. Houston kind of went under with the, with the oil boom and they diversified. But we got together and said, we're going to do this with our new ways of doing business. We're going to take innovation, entrepreneurship, and science, wherever it is, and we're going to make entrepreneurship, put entrepreneurship at the very, very center of communities. And I didn't believe George. And George said, we're going to create some laboratories 
which we're going to call incubators. We go to the university and say, we won't do an incubator. And, oh, we don't do incubators. We do laboratory, chemistry labs. We said, we want a laboratory. And that laboratory because I became my incubator. So it was, a, it was a stressful time for us. And we look around, and Texans have always been very, very entrepreneurial. But I look around today in, in 2014, and, and I look at the statistics. 98% of all of the great companies that scale in the last 40 years were just founded in three places. 128 in Boston, Microsoft, et cetera. Austin, Texas, Dale, Whole Foods, Nash Instruments, et cetera. And of course, Silicon Valley, Hewlett Packard, Hotmail, eBay, Apple, or whatever have you. Well, why are we sitting here and letting everybody kick our butt when it comes to developing companies and creating wealth? Why should our graduates have to leave Austin, Texas and go to Silicon Valley or go to 128 in Boston? Why can't they stay at home? And George said, I want my grandkids to have a place in Austin. So we started by creating what we would call the ecosystem for entrepreneurs. One of our first lessons. And by the way, we got it from Silicon Valley. We went out there, we studied it, and we're no Silicon Valley. We've done a great job in Austin. Austin is, is out of control, it is booming. There's more wealth in Austin. We have created more wealth in Austin than any other place in America in the last 10 years, including Silicon Valley. But the idea was very, very simple a very complex, was how do you change a city? Okay. There's Dallas, that's all corporate. You know, when I go to Dallas, I rent me a Rolls Royce so I can feel at home. <laughs> Austin is all blue jeans and, and T-shirts, and, and you know, we had, you know, we had the hippies, you know. And, you know, everybody smoke, everybody smoke marijuana, you know, everybody come. We said, how can we change this? So we go to the chamber, we go to the city council, but more importantly, we go to the wealth. We go to the boys and girls and all and gays. It's very, very simple. We're going to give you a value proposition to help us out. As a matter of fact, from now on, you will be our heroes. The wealth creators, we love everybody. We love Earl Cam, our great running back. We love Dale Raw. Cosmetics say these are our heroes, but in the future we will be a city of business enterprise and the heroes will be entrepreneurs. That was Ross Perot in Dallas who had $10,000 $10, at the time. That was Herb Kelleher, a great friend of mine, messing around with an airplane that became Southwest Airlines, flying uh, city to city. That was Michael Dale who had just dropped out of school and his parents came in a frenzy and said, uh-uh, uh-uh, this won't happen. And, and our most distinguished dropout started, Dell Computers. Came to the Institute, we began a process of competition. We began a, began a process of competing with Silicon Valley, with 128 in Boston. And by the way, that's who we compete with. We compete on talent, we compete on wealth. There's more flights between we have more flights between Austin and Silicon Valley. We have more in common with the Valley than we have with Dallas. We cringe when Stanford comes steal our professor in macular biology or biotechnology because we know that that might be an industry. And then we said, we're going to do the game, and I can tell you this. We did the game so well that the whole city and the whole s has been transformed. Well, why was it transformed? What, what, what did we do that was so different? First is you have, you know, you gotta have a visionary, and, and, and John George is your visionary. I said, John, you, you're the new Kosmeski, okay? Yeah, I've been there 40 years, but I was, my mentors were George Kosmeski. You know, those, those individuals who could see beyond yesterday to tomorrow. There's absolutely no reason why there's absolutely no reason why Shreveport certainly cannot be a part of that situation. And by the way, as an indication, uh, when I went to Austin, the, the LSU alumni was 10 of us, not 800, 800 of us. Well, you know why? Because people are leaving, right, and moving to Austin. So one of the things that we said, and some of the lessons that we learned, 
It's as follows. When you give wealth a different value proposition, that hey, we need to build a stadium. And go to wealth and say, we want you to help us to create an entrepreneurial ecosystem where entrepreneurship is at the very, very center of everything that we do. Okay. So when we have events, because our entrepreneurs have paid off, Dale just gave $50 million for Dale, we're going to build a new med school in, in Austin, right? Uh, John Mackey, bless his heart, with Whole Foods. John Mackey was a great hippie in Austin, created Whole Foods. He's coming to Shreveport. Uh, when I was here in this building, uh, we called him. And, and uh, I guess we were on the list, but I said, you know, it was that, it was that phone call that uh, John George that got Whole Foods here. So they have really, really paid off. All of a sudden, Dale goes public and creates almost a thousand millionaires in Austin, that's 30 million apiece. Okay. But where did it all come from? What was the place of wealth? The place of wealth in all engaged was very, very simple. We said take a chance on the kids. Now why did I say the kids? Michael was 19, Gates was 21, the guy that started Smith Federal Express was 22, the guy that started Facebook was 16. So what's happening here? What is there about a synergy that takes place where kids get involved and create all the, the different kind of wealth? So it's, it's a different city because we said to the wealth, help us out. Well, we had to organize the wealth. So we organized something called the Texas Network. It was all, all engaged. And we said, we're going to create the Capital Network, Texas Capital Network. And I want you guys and gals to take a chance on the new ideas. And I never forget. We created the incubator. We had, we had a guy from West Texas, you know, in his, in his, in his, in his cowboy boots, hats, hats. I mean, you know, a typical Texas. He said, I don't know what you boys and girls are doing up here, but keep doing it because we just put $38 million in his pocket because he invested. So at the very, very center of all of this, it's the importance of wealth. Now, me being from the great state of Louisiana, me being from southern Louisiana, especially, I know what the state can do when we put our mind to it. But see, northern Louisiana, Shreveport, is situated particular for the kinds of opportunities that we are talking about. Because the wealth is here, and I know the wealth is here, but it's in families. Okay? And in Louisiana, I know because I'm from one of those families, it's kind of families, you don't lend money to anybody unless they're families. I have a brother in southern Louisiana. I'm from Franklinton, the great city of Franklinton. And my brother says, you know, we, uh, so we have some buildings. And, and my brother said, I said, well, you know, so-and-so and so want this building to do a barbershop. Oh, no, 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 he's not family. I said, invest in the kid and give him a shot. So what you have to do is begin to understand that it becomes a total community kind of investment where wealth and self-employment as John said, it's the other leg of economic development. So in addition to bringing companies, right, to the city, you create companies, but where does it come from? The science can come from anywhere. It could come from DOD. It could come from NASA. NASA wherever people are inventing things, because this is the possibility of wealth. It is the relationship between IP, intellectual property, and how business models are changed in the process of wealth creation. So let's, let me give you an example, again, from Austin, Texas. I'm going to be like my grandfather and take my company as an example. Can I, may I do that? Is this an advertisement? That's OK. I'm in the great state of Louisiana. I'm not going to indict it, get indicted, am I? <laughs> When I, ran, when I ran the Fulbright for, 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 for the president, and they said, uh, Dr. Butler, is there anything that you need to know, that we need to know about you, that might embarrass the president? I said, well, I'm from the great state of Louisiana, where half the state's on the water, and the other half is on indictment. So, 
They have to be careful. So I did a company called Glowfish. I want to talk about here. And we just changed the business model. It is genetically altered pet fish right out of the laboratory. They were trying to create a situation where fish were, were sensitive to pollutants. And we took that concept from the lab. I got a former student, Alan Blake, and now we're leading the industry. It's all about science. Okay? It's all about, of course, enhancing through science all of the other kind of in industries that you have. So the idea then is to say, if there is any kind of innovation here, is there, if there is somebody in Shreveport that's doing a, anything with dogs, I've been working with an entrepreneur, Dexter Blanche here, that has a chastity belt for dogs. He called me and I thought he was playing a trick on me. <laughs> He's got it in 18 different countries, but it's an IP. He has the intellectual property. So my point is, if you take and you add all that together, there becomes a synergy. Well, entrepreneurship is placed at the very, very center and the entire community changes. So in addition to that economic development portion, where you're inviting companies in or you're growing companies, all of a sudden you're starting companies and you don't need 15 of them. Okay? So I major in Austin, my hometown now 40 years, there's Whole Foods, there's Dell, there's National Instruments, and there's Evolutionary Technologies. I'll tell you about Evolutionary Technologies. This is one of my good friends here, it's called Workplace Warrior. She came to Austin, Texas, she did our first company. She was on the front of Fortune Magazine. Her name is Kay Ham. I said, girl, where are you from? I went to Bird High School, I'm from Shreveport, Louisiana. I had to leave, leave Shreveport, Louisiana because there was no ecosystem there for starting a company. I said, you from where? She said, I'm from Shreveport, Louisiana. I said, you mean that school uh, well, in South Louisiana, we say up north? <laughs> Shreveport, Louisiana. I called her yesterday. She's still in love with Shreveport. And she said to me, I'm so happy that Shreveport is now in the game of creating and supporting entrepreneurs. I think she sold it for, I don't know, over 50 million. She now, she's now laid on the West Coast, out there having a good time. She loves Bird High School. She said she went to Bird High School. I talked to her all the time. But our first hero in Austin, Texas, was a woman from Shreveport, Louisiana. Anybody know Kay Hammer? Anybody heard of Kay Hammer? You can Google it. <laughs> you can Google it. OK. So now the question becomes, what are we doing now in terms of the relationship between Freeport and Austin, IC Square, et cetera. That is, you know, what, what are we trying to do now? Okay. I think Shreveport is, is, un, is uniquely, as I said, situated to get in this game of creating companies and doing great things. It's just a change of rhetoric. It's a change of how you think about the world. It's a change of creating and celebrating wealth. I like to tell people, God told me, I gave a talk in Austin, he said, this is the first university or place I've heard of that celebrates wealth. Usually people are beating up on the wealthy. In Austin, Texas, we celebrate wealth. When somebody makes 50 million, it's the front page of the paper. In Southern Louisiana, they hide it. No, we want you to be the heroes. My minister said to me, well, you know, uh, Dr. Butler, that uh, uh, money is the, I said, the lack of money is the cause of all evil. And by the way, minister, if you, don't, if you think that's true, why are you always asking me for it? <laughs> so the point is, is to change that. I see Square is, is working with people in Shreveport because we think that we have certain lessons that can help Shreveport along. Shreveport would do its own thing. But it's a vision that's important. Shreveport has already developed an investment group, an angel network, a new angel network in Louisiana. And by the way, the folks down south in my way are taking note of what's going on 
because all of a sudden they said, well, you know what? We, maybe we need to do like and be like Shreveport. The New Louisiana Angel Fund, which puts entrepreneurs at the center of everything. Now, I liked it because I grew up where entrepreneurship was at the center of everything. My grandfather and my father and my family, we were so entrepreneur, you know, and that just meant living differently. I like to tell people, you know, I was giving a talk in Chicago and people like said, well, you know, my name is, my name is da, 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 and you know, I grew up hard. I said, you know, my name is John Sibley Butler. I'm a fourth generation PhD MD from the state of Louisiana. Fourth generation wealth from the state of Louisiana because we put entrepreneurship at the very, very center of what, of everything. So what we're doing here is we're taking the lessons. And we're introducing, shake, people who understand, people who understand the model to people in Austin who understand the model. So I'm going to ask our mayors who were mayor in Austin during the great glory years when we started to talk to the people in Shreveport. Jamie Rhodes came and helped to organize the IP lawyers. We have IP lawyers that's interested in helping out. We have wealthy people who, as I said, created an angel network. Because this is the kind of game where you come to. I'm not interested in recruiting anybody. I'm interested in everybody joining in. And I tell you, what happens is that at the IC Square Institute, and we have worked with countries all over this globe. My latest book is 13 countries in the IC Square model. Right? And so what we're trying to do is to say, we're going to bring certain people to Austin. So the last time we brought people over there, we had Jay, we had Michael Williams, we had other people there, and they were kind of scratching their head. Jay was scratching his head and said, what? Oh, what is this wealth creation? Uh, what is wealth, Dr. Butler? Okay. So what we're doing is trying to understand and appreciate people to appreciate our model. So we're going to have some synergy there. So we're going to ask people to come to Austin again, not for Shreveport to be like Austin, but for people from Shreveport to talk about people in Austin, talk to people in Austin who have done great things, especially as we were coming along. And then we're going to come back to Shreveport and do a process of how do you look at good deals? How do you look at good science? And how do you do these kind of things? And thank God for the Biomed Group because, you know, like I said, I'm from the state of Louisiana. I've been working all over the country. And I've been talking about this model. I said, you know, Texas is kicking out, is kicking out butts in economic development. Why is it that when I, when I finished from college, Baton Rouge was so far ahead of, of Austin while we, while, you know, I had Mark Emery come to Austin. You know, I worked with certain kind of governors. And then I got this guy, John George, who all of a sudden understands the model. The only person I've seen, by the way, in the great state of Louisiana who really understands the model. So we're happy to help out. If you have any questions, uh, John said you've you got to get back to work here. If you have any questions, uh, we'll, we'll take questions. So I'm glad to be here, and this is what we're doing in, in Shreveport, and uh, the Bowman Group has lots of great things, but I want to talk about not only what they have done, but what we want to help them to do. So are there any questions at all? Hang on, we got a mic. Let us mic John. John, won't you come up so you can take any questions about, about uh, Shreveport also? Hey, sir. How you doing? I'm Jerry Rohr, obviously with the Air Force. So you talked a lot about how it takes a community to build entrepreneurship. How did you find those people in Austin? You talked about Michael Dell's success story and those avenues. You created that incubator. How do you get people to that incubator? Because Shreveport's small, but we're finding some here and there. How do we bring them together? Well, here's the deal. You see, I'm going to ask you a question now. If you want to be a movie star, where do you go? Hollywood. If you want to be an opera singer, where do you go? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to be a linebacker, where do you go? NFL, Denver Broncos. <laughs> if you want to start a company, where do you go? Boulder, Denver, Colorado. Well, the point Island. is, once you get that system, that ecosystem, people will come. 
Our problem now, we have so many people coming to Austin Star Companies. Originally, like in my MBA class, right, my undergraduates are so active in starting, they're more active than the MBAs, by the way, in starting companies. So what happens is that you get an early win, all of a sudden the world changes. So we got a, we got a kid who dropped out, right? He's not in all engaged, you don't have to dig in the saw, nothing wrong with that, because I grew up digging in the saw. All of a sudden you, you're using this, People are writing softwares, all kind of companies have come along, so there's a synergy that takes place where people automatically kind of come. But we did it through our, our original incubator, we did it through networking, we did it by introducing people to the ideas of, of starting companies as that late. My, my worst experience was IBM guys who had been laid off and had no idea of, of how to live in America by starting a company. Because we were all trained very managerial and not to say, how do you create the future? Remember, as we sit here in Shreveport, Captain Shreve is one of the most entrepreneurial people in the state, with all kind of intellectual property around ships and et cetera. So actually, Shreveport started based on that model. John, I, I don't need that. I think people All right, James. Hi, uh, John Atkins. Thank you for coming to town. Um, I think Shreveport in recent years has made nice strides in, in supporting entrepreneurship at, at the earliest stage. There's the startup prize, which helps us to stimulate uh, competition between entrepreneurial ideas. And then you've got the cohabitat to help carry things along. And then when a company gets to a point where it might be ready for seed capital, then you, you've got the, the Louisiana uh, Seed Capital Fund here at Biomed. But one of the gaps that, that we've found challenging is that, that uh, period between when a new idea is identified through like the startup prize, uh, but the entrepreneurs are young and you know, you know, they're creative, but they don't really have all the tools in their toolkit to grow a business and make an idea into a real business. And yet we don't have that many, we don't have many venture capital funds. We've got a couple of venture capital funds, but our our resources to support those young entrepreneurs are fairly limited. And uh, so oftentimes I think those young entrepreneurs struggle for additional intellectual support. Uh, have you seen this problem in other oh, areas? Absolutely, and if because, so, how do they address it? Absolutely, because what happens is you need mentors. And you need mentors in different sectors. If it's in the bio sector, you need a mentor. If it's in software, you need a mentor. And you need mentors connect the idea to the market. And I think what Shreveport needs is an early win. That is, what will happen is, and what happened to us is that when, when we put K Hammer on the, on, on, on the front of um, a Forbes magazine, all of a sudden people start seeking and wanting to be a part of us. Okay? And it's not, by the way, it's just not just the entrepreneurs, it's the board of directors. Okay? It is, it's the accountants, right? It's people who understand finance. And the, and the biggest takeaway for us is when you're starting a company, you have to really do pro bono for the entrepreneur. So it was hard for us, for lawyers to understand, hey, I know you, you, know, you got an advanced degree, but you still work by the hour. So why don't we do this? Let's get a bundle of entrepreneur firms. If, if one hits, then you will, and et cetera. So therefore, the mentoring is always, is always if people are trying to do it online now, for example, in Austin, Texas, we don't have the bio stuff. It's in Houston. Okay, so it's hard to start a bio company and also because we cut our, our, you know, on our T4 software, our computers, and et cetera. So, but what we've tried to do is, that's why we're building a med school. Because we, we have no idea, really, of how to start a bio company. Now, the best bio company that was started was my company, Glowfish. Okay? But all of my experts came from the University of Miami, uh, Virginia Tech. These were professors who did the, uh, the genetic stuff. So I think that if you can marry, it's about market identification. And if you can, you can marry the market with those mentors. But you, Shreveport needs an early win. And those mentors, it's oftentimes pro bono, is what you're saying. Yes. You get, you get, you get support around it. You tell them what we're doing. Yes. Yeah, so, so one of the things that the Biomed's doing is um, Hi, yeah, John. Uh, one of the, to, to fill that gap, and you know, you know, we started this process six months ago, so we're just ramping up right now. But uh, we, Dave has come in and leads the projects. Uh, Dave's forte has, has been to uh, multi-institutional uh, grants, 
that's really his forte. So Dave has met with every president uh, from East Mississippi to uh, uh, east of Louisiana to West Louisiana in this North I-20 I corridor. And we're trying to align, and right now Dave is looking at all their uh, initiatives, okay, and to see where we have synergies on our initiatives and their initiatives that we can focus these 120,000 students that we're saying to, to come together. We, uh, Centenary College has helped us quite a bit. Uh, we actually are contracting with some of their professors over there. We're working with every uh, institution to look for interns. We have an intern from tech right now that's working with uh, an entrepreneur from the Air Force Base. Um, so, and we've hired uh, two uh, financial analysts, which seems to be one of our downfalls in the city is all our entrepreneurs are, are lacking uh, uh, financial um, IQ, as I call it. So they're helping our entrepreneurs build their models. Uh, we have uh, made relationships with IP lawyers. We've made relationships with consultants. We have uh, some co consultants in from uh, New York right now that are helping uh, us with two or three of our uh, entrepreneurs. And all our, our effort is focused on two pieces. We're trying to service the entrepreneur. So if you come in and you have an idea and you need help to get it to a, what we call a, a pitch book, okay, um, we'll do that for you. Okay, that's our job. We'll get you the pitch book. We also, on the other side of the street, have organized the, the, the wealth and we have our first angel fund. And um, uh, we're at a million and a half dollars right now. We're hoping to have uh, two and a half million uh, before we close it at the end of March. And nobody the, turn you down. The first 26 people we asked invested. We had nobody turn us down. So we, uh, we, we tried to get money out of Louisiana Economic Development, and that's why we stopped. Um, we recently uh, have failed at that effort. They've run out of money, run into some trouble, so we're going to open it back up in this first fund and try to finish out the million dollars. And as soon as we finish out that million dollars, we'll start our next fund. We have a relationship. Jamie has come down for, up from Texas, and we've made a relationship with the Texas Angel Fund. And he's also working with New Orleans, and we're, we're trying to have a relationship with them. I haven't been able to get down there and meet their president. But we're, we're uh, and so I'm holding that up. But we, we have, we're starting to build the network. And like John says, we need to get, uh, you know, our first deals through the, 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 the mill. We've gotten, we have 60 deals we've looked at. We've, we, 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 we need to get those finished. We've committed to the city and the parish that we would do 100 a year. And so our, our job um, is to um, get these to where they have a business plan and a presentable pitch book. And that's what I offered the city and the parish and my board of directors um, that we would accomplish. So I, we also have to answer to our board of, of the things that we need to be uh, doing. Dave, are you going to get up and, 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 and speak? Okay. That's a, but Dave, Dave has, um, you know, one of the things at the Biomed that we're, we're, we we're bringing to the table that I, don't, I think has been lacking is accountability. So uh, one of the things that we promised our board, and all these entrepreneurs, you know, once we get them through, um, our service part and then we start helping them with management we will be helping them be successful because the money that we have will not be all the money that they need okay that doesn't happen okay it doesn't happen like that so we will they'll probably have to go outside this community at some point in time to get even bigger money if they're successful okay? Which everybody does. But, yeah, right, everybody it might be everywhere. that might be new york it might be chicago and we're committed to helping these guys through the process. That's why we have a fund manager, Ron Ondachek, is from New Orleans, and he's running our running our fund fund management part. And so those kind of things will be, uh, and they'll be held accountable for hurdles. They'll be you know, you said that you were going to do this. Now we're going to monitor that, and if they don't, we're going to you know squeeze them. We're going to push them. And we need to do those kind of things to make these things successful, these businesses successful. And we're doing that not only on our um, entrepreneur side, but the BioMed's doing it for our internal things that we do. We, you know, we're into uh, the Center for Molecular Imaging Therapy. We do uh, uh, 
Uh, we're a real estate company. We have 340,000 square feet that we manage. Um, we uh, have the uh, Digital Media Institute. And once we get this in line, we hope our tenants that you know uh, are, are 20 strong now will also be able to offer them those services to help them with their management. And we're building this team. It's a small team right now, and we outsource a lot. But we know what we need, and we're going to be trying to do this for our community. Questions? Uh, Dr. Roseman at first, and then I'll come to you, Jack. Uh, I, I um, it was a, um, telling, I think, well, when you tell the story of Kay Hammer and asked the question, did anybody know who she was? And I didn't see any uh, hands raised. And, and it's interesting, the number of people, I think, over the last 30 years, fa wealthy families, uh, some have left Shreveport, gone other places. When you were getting started in Austin, it was, it was also during a time, I think, of a bad time of oil and gas business. Oh, yes. We, we, had, we had empty real estate space. Uh, banks were closing. Companies being resized. And that's when we did, yes. Yeah. So did you, did you start just with people that are living there now, or did you go out to some of the people that had left, maybe? Oh, and, yeah. Uh, we, and ask them to come back and support their old city because they love the whatever high school you have in Austin? Absolutely. Not only that, and Dave is a good example of this. Uh, Dave, the basketball star from Reevesville High School, uh, he came to Austin. He said, John, if we could do something like this in Shreveport, I'm leaving the Washington area and I'm coming home. Okay. Now, what has happened in Austin is that, yes, we reached out to people, and I tell you what, I played golf with a guy from Freeport, Louisiana. He just sold his, his tool company for $86 million, and he lives in Houston right now. And uh, played with, with Bab, and uh, I can get his name. And everybody that you talk to, right, everybody's interested in their home community. And, I mean, we talked to Kay, Kay Hammer uh, yesterday, and she was so excited about what was happening in Shreveport. So, yes, the answer is yes. We bought almost everybody back home to Austin, Texas. And that's very, very important. So we started that process, and people started saying, hey, you know, if my hometown is going to do this, well, I can do this in, uh, in Shreveport now. I don't have to do it in D.C. In DC. So here's a guy who was, who was a big muckety-muck up there in, in, in Washington, D.C., and he said, if we can do this, John, I'm coming home. And here he is. Okay. Yes, sir. Dr. Butler, I'm Jack Sharp. First of all, thank you for engaging with us and giving us the wisdom of your experiences. <clears throat> it's very, very important to this community that we have uh, places to draw knowledge from. And, right. and I regard what you're doing as being critical. Um, I have a question, though, on Austin, and I hope that you can clarify or, or whatever. I heard, and I have no basis for this other than hearsay, but I heard that back when uh, the state of Texas took its uh, tobacco settlement monies and invested heavily in education, higher education at UT and at A&M both. And the result of that was bringing in eminent scholars, basically buying them, bringing them in. Like me. I don't know if you were if you were one of them or not. Sir. Absolutely, but can you can you uh, talk a bit to the relevance and the importance of that investment in higher ed as it relates to the economic development in Austin? Yes, good question. It was really John Connolly. Uh, when I got there in '74, John Connolly of John Kennedy fame, who was hit in the uh, assassination of, of the president, came back home and he said, "I'm going to tell y'all something." We were down at the the Headliners Club, which is the club like we have in Austin here. He said, I'm going to tell you guys something. I want you to listen to me. UT Austin is an average university now. And if you guys don't fix all of this educationally, all the money is going to the Northeast, it's going to Northwestern, it's going to Stanford. Case closed. So O'Donnell put together a matching. He gave $10 million to switch the University of Texas 
from a good state school to a major research university. We do over 800 million in basic research at the University of Texas at Austin. But also, we have a surplus of, the state has a surplus of 17 million. But remember that in this case, it's, it's, and, it's, and it's very unusual, because of the oil and gas in West Texas, the university has an endowment of 12 billion because of that. But what you're saying is that in our case, our economy rests on research and knowledge and know-how. But it's also connected to DOD research. It is connected to all of this kind of, you know, I mean, blessed, you know, we love Rice University, okay? So they did all the nanotechnology stuff. And Rice University helped to, to renegotiate uh, that economic situation. So yes, we did take the money from, uh, from the, from the, to the back of stuff and, and enhance the education experience. Now, but I work in countries where there are no universities, like Malta. I've worked in countries where we, we imported technologies to that country to create the model. Uh, UT Austin as a state school is very unique. It's a very, very wealthy institute. And it has lots of issues of state schools, you know, because the, the, the school is wealthy in the states and, you know, there's always a conflict between the chancellor, and et cetera. But you're absolutely right. The education in itself is very, very important because Stanford built Silicon Valley. <coughs> MIT, not Harvard, 128 in Boston. And IC Square was very, very instrumental in what we've done. You know. But there are also different models. So we're working in different places, like in, in South Carolina, as I said, in countries, where you can actually import the technologies. Because with the movement of science now, and with Google Patents, like in my MBA class, you just go on Google Patents, and what you've got to do is create a business based on a patent. So yes, are you alluding to what's happening in the great state of Louisiana, the cutting of education? Well, there's a train wreck that's coming. I'm well, I'm well, I'm well aware of that. But I can tell you this, you know, um, I think that uh, all communities have got to get it together and figure out something if that happens. You know, you just have to figure it out. So um, I know in my, uh, in my, in my LSU alma mater, it's very different in Northwestern. Northwestern tuition is 60000 a year and nobody complains and, and in Chicago. Or 68000 a year and nobody complains. But I know that, that LSU needs another forever LSU and they need to raise a billion dollars because you cannot allow you know, that kind of stuff to have that impact on future generations. You gotta do like Michigan did. Michigan went under, but the University of Michigan held its head up. So whatever you do that, you're gonna have to figure that out and, and look to another future. Here again, I would say on behalf of us here in Shreveport and Cato, we are grateful that you embrace us with your presence and sharing your intellectual capital with us. But I must uh, also, I'm also concerned about the relationship uh, of spreading, of getting the word out to the minorities in the African American community, because we know disproportionately uh, it has not been equal. So, uh, Dr. Joel, would you let them know how you're trying to equalize opportunity with? The relationship you build with some of the minorities, the colleges, the university, and your new hiree, and explain what their role is going to be. Thank you. Good. Come on, John. Let me tell you what we did in Austin. So, um, my cousin Natalie, whom you know, yeah. that you fell in love with, <laughs> good Cane River girl. We had a, uh, we had a, uh, we had an African American chamber, but we're such a global community now. We had to switch it to. Uh, to the black chamber because the blacks from, from Britain says, hey, I'm not American, I'm British. I'm from Haiti, I'm not, so stop calling me an American. But that is technology uh, we had on the front of uh, Black Enterprise, six companies with $50 million or more. Uh, and so what we did was to, to, to reorganize. We also have an Asian chamber. We have a Hispanic chamber. I did a book on wealth creation and, and, uh, and uh, Mexican American entrepreneurship. And so I think that in, I think in those cases, I can, I can remember Shreveport where, you know, when I, went, when I went to college, I remember Juanita Power, who, by the way, is the third wealthiest family in the state of, in the country now, black family. She, she went to, uh, she's from Shreveport, and she went to Notre Dame High School, which was a private high school then. So I think you have to, uh, those communities have to refocus 
In the black situation, the refocus on, on Boogie Washington wealth creation. I mean, I grew up in a situation where people created my high school with a private high school, which probably was the best high school I might add in Franklinton. Uh, we had just as much land or more wealth as the, as the white community, unquote, unquote. So I think you have to refocus uh, what I call refocusing back to the, the, the idea of, uh, of wealth creation and, and, uh, and doing those kind of things. And so I know you'll be happy to talk to Natalie in the future, but, but Natalie has reorganized it and she is uh, that, you know, and again, she has problems in changing it, okay? Because you gotta, you gotta, all communities have gotta switch to what can you do? So my father and grandfather always said we can do you know, we can do anything, so that's got to change. And I also think you got to put entrepreneurs at the center of communities, you know, and those have to be the leaders in, in the communities. And, you know, and the biomed is going to try to do this, okay? You know, oh, I'm sorry. The, bi the biomed is going to try to take on this job, all right? I think we're uniquely situated to be the uh, economic engine for the entrepreneur in this city. Okay, um, we did this, it really, it, uh, it's been done. Jack started this, and his board, and his board before him, this was their idea, and, but they focused it on research out of LSU. And quite frankly, I think that was the, that was the stumbling block, because it, the, the, the processes were just too difficult within the state. So what we're gonna try to do is broaden this thing and do it th with the community and we believe you know LSU has a lot of graduates that are entrepreneurs and what happens is is you know once you get into that state funnel it just gets like a grinding machine and slows down and so we're going to try to open this up at the same time continue to work with LSU especially you know with all the change that has gone over there and I think they're willing to to open up and change and look at it being a little bit more creative we're going to put this platform in place and see if it works. Now, will it work? I don't have that crystal ball, but it has worked in the past. It's our job to get out to, to celebrate the wealthy, to bring the wealthy in, to try them to understand, to, to integrate them with the minority community, to give the opportunities that all communities need to have the, you know, to, to have start business and do entrepreneur. So that, we're just uniquely situated. I just don't, you know, we, we have uh, a, a great platform. I, I wish every, all my board members, if y'all would step, we have a great board that has, you know, has embraced this idea. They were the first ones to take on the challenge of the uh, uh, university health to bring that in. You know, I mean, those are risk takers that are well thought out risk takers. And that's what we need now. We don't need people hiding behind this. I didn't do that. We need to take some risk. And this is taking a risk. But we're not doing it just, you know, by happenstance. We're going and looking at the best, okay? I've flown up to Ohio a couple of times to look at their program. You know, we're trying to find people that can show us the way and if we give us enough time, if we can get, you know, if we can get five years under our belt and 500 companies looked at, the odds are with us. It's a numbers game. It's just like going in a gambling boat, you know? If you draw enough hands, you're gonna get a pair of aces, right? Well, we're looking for our pair of aces out here in the community. Yeah. And let right? me say this, let me say this, Mike. Michael, let me say, in Silicon Valley, it was all Asian and Indians. Now, this is different. In Austin, Texas, I can't tell you the, the, the Asians and the Indians, and, and in Houston, it's, it's the Nigerian, it's the Africans. Okay, but you got to come to the table. So, you know, uh, as the Africans tell me, um, well, you know, Dr. Butler, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do this, and Mafusho has a, has a billion dollar company. I mean, he's been in America for 25 years. He's Nigerian. So in addition to all of these emails that you get that said, you know, I need $55, I'm trapped in from the Nigerian population. <laughs> You have got to be very, very, and my, and my message to Freeport and, and to you is, okay, you get the wealth in that community and you come to the table. You know, and I say this, I don't want John going out and saying, I got to recruit black, no, no, you come to the table if you want to be very, very entrepreneur. Okay, you come to the table and, uh, and you get it done. Okay, so what we've done in Austin, uh, what Natalie has done, and she said, you know, she had a lot of bumps going there, is to say, look, we're gonna deal with all the wealthy blacks, 
you know, and we're going to have you to create and join our angel networks. That's what we've done. So uh, as a matter of fact, your job is to create the wealth. Find the wealth, right, and call me, <laughs> right? You know, because this, no, this is no recruitment thing. You know, come on with it. You know, if you, if you, if you can shoot the basketball, come on with it and get it done. Yes. Not just being um, black businesses, but a lot of people who are in business are mostly self-employed. Mm -hmm. Our small businesses in this area uh, all comprise maybe 10 employees or less. Mm -hmm. That's America, by the way. Yes, sir, it is. Mm -hmm. But your EAP program, does it necessarily have to be just people with new ideas? What are you doing for the ones who already have existing businesses that need to get to the same point where you're trying to get those? Well, let me say, and then I can jump. I think that, that it's going to be business with intellectual property that create wealth. So I make a big distinction between small business, like I grew up in, and wealth creation business. Okay, so I like to use the example. I have a good friend, Carl Paul. He found a golfsmith. Okay, it took him, it took him 42 years. He sold it for $250 million. God bless America. Okay, I know people who started with entrepreneur firms, okay, they, they created a company and, and uh, Facebook bought a company for a billion dollars that, that had, no, had no sales. I think that in my space, it is the creation of enterprises, right, that would allow wealth creation through intellectual property and to scale. And I think that's very, very different than small enterprises. Now, what we have in Austin, we have something called Big Austin. They also did Amos Ice Cream. Uh, they did a lot of good stuff. They're, they're, they are traditionally looking at businesses who have, who have uh, revenue in the small business space and they want to expand. And that's what they do. And in order to do that, you, you go through Big Austin, that's B-I-G, I'm on their board, A-U-S-T-I-N, and we've got, we, we've got first generation immigrants from Mexico who need a lawn service. They need a lawnmower. They need a pickup truck. They need some, I mean, we got all kind of stuff. Now, to me, in my mind, that's very, very different than what I think I would ask John to do, and that is to, to create enterprises, to create enterprises as a result of the science that happens. But I think what happens in the case is that if you look at Big Austin, Jay, Jay, can you get that done by tomorrow? And create, create an organization that's big organization. So I don't, I don't see it as a small, small enterprise. I see it as, as a um, technology transfer and wealth creation. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how you see yeah, it. Right now we're focused. And they're all important, by the way. Right. They're all, it's part of the stools. It's, it's, it's the recruit business, support the business that you have, and help create businesses. So we're in the leg of the stool of helping create businesses, okay? Whether it comes out of LSU, whether it comes off the street, whether it comes from the 120,000 students across North Louisiana, you know, or the 5,000 professors that are there. So, you know, I, my argument is we're bigger than LSU, okay? North Louisiana is bigger than LSU, A&M, and Baton Rouge, if you put all that together. But it takes effort. It takes a group. It takes the, you know, the, the, the honest broker to pull that together. And we've tried, we've done it several times, and we're gonna try again. But we're adding a different little switch to it. And this is, we're gonna support, be the service group to service the entrepreneur, okay? And we're gonna connect them with the wealth. And I think that's the piece that's missing in this economic engine. And so, that's what we're gonna focus on. You know, I hope y'all will support us. I hope you'll give us, um, your, your time, your money, and your effort, because we're going to need all three from the community. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's been great. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again. Okay. <laughs>